join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Martin Mulvihill. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you all for coming out here tonight. It's a real honor to be here at the National Academies. As someone who's been a scientist for as long as I can remember, uh, to be able to give a talk here at the National Academies is certainly uh, quite an honor. But before I get started telling you about what I do now, I want to take you back a few years to my first job as a scientist. It was the summer after my freshman year, undergraduate studying chemistry at Reed College, and I applied to all the internships, the ones on campus, the ones at other universities, and I was sure that I was going to spend my summer at a, at a university lab. But it didn't work out that way. It looked like I was going to head back to my hometown in Fresno, California. Not too far from here. <laughs> so with a heavy heart, I packed my bags um, and luckily got a piece of advice that said, check out this place doing laboratory research on pesticides. And I thought, oh, thank goodness. I'm not going to have to go back to the health club and hand out towels again this summer. I'm going to be a scientist. What did I study? That's right, your friend and mine. It was an eye-opening experience. My first job as a scientist was working at an independent research laboratory that was part of the registration process for pesticides being used here in California. And so they'd gone through their, their EPA registration and in order to be used in the state of California, you had to demonstrate efficacy in the field. So uh, you hire a firm like the one I worked for that summer to go out and see if these pesticides functioned as, uh, as they were advertised so that they could come onto the market here in California. What that meant in reality is I spent every day in 110 degree heat going into uh, housing projects uh, offering free pesticide service uh, to see whether or not uh, these pesticides actually worked. It was a really hard job, and I learned some really important things that summer, not only about uh, cockroaches and pesticides, but about how science works and about what I wanted to do in this world of science. The three lessons I took away from that summer in 110 degree heat looking at cockroaches, where one, science in the real world is a whole lot more complex than science in the laboratory. It deals with people, it deals with behavior, it deals with choices and perceptions that may or may not be borne out in all of the data. And that's an interesting challenge for us scientists. It's one of the things that I encourage my students at Berkeley to embrace. That complexity and that challenge of explaining what we do to a broader audience, that challenge of getting out of your comfort zone and figuring out that not everything can be isolated to a single variable and put in a spectrometer, seems apropos given we're in the Beckman Center. So lesson number two, lesson number one, things are much more complex than you expect. Lesson number two, people like things that work. Not surprising. But one of the things I ran into over and over that summer was I would go in and I would be testing these pesticide treatments and the way we studied their efficacy is we put out pheromone traps. So traps with pheromones to attract cockroaches, get them to come on and then you could see week after week where there are more or less cockroaches coming to the traps. I would come back week two, week three or come back to do another application of the, the pesticide and almost universally, people asked me not to put the chemicals back in, but they wanted the traps. They wanted the thing that, was count, that I was using as a, a measurement tool. They loved the pheromone traps. It was clear they were working. You put them in, you could open them up, you could count the cockroaches, that was my job. Um, they also felt safer to them. They felt like that was a less invasive sort of treatment, a way of dealing with the cockroach problem without having to remove all of their cooking utensils and everything from their kitchen so that I can apply a pesticide. So that perception um, of, and that desire for something that works and that functions and that you can understand 
It's something that drives our consumer behavior and drives our relationship with chemistry. Something that is, you'll see as a through line throughout what I tell you about tonight. Third lesson, working with cockroaches, Fresno, California. Uh, that is that people treat chemistry as if it's dangerous until proven safe. Drives my chemistry colleagues nuts, but it's true. Think about it for yourself. People uh, would have to be shown that a chemistry, especially a pesticide, but any chemistry is safe before they're comfortable using it. That leads me to a really important question and one of the reasons why I helped start the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry. As I continued in my career, I realized chemistry is all around us. That's why I love chemistry. Whether you're talking about soaps or carpets or textiles, chemistry is the world that we live in. So the question becomes, who's looking out for that chemistry that we bring into our everyday home? And that question is actually not easy to answer. So here's some of the obvious options, right? For the most part, uh, I've actually done this talk and colleagues of mine uh, have done this talk in front of uh, chemists at the American Chemical Society and you ask them and they all vote. Most of them think it's the EPA. Some people think it's an international body. The reality is the chemistry that we bring into our home, the chemistry that we're most intimate with, actually has the least oversight. I would argue it has some oversight. So you have some uh, registration processes, both here in the US and in Europe. But the reality is, for the most part, the chemistry that we bring into our homes, the things that we give to our families, things that we interact with on a daily basis, it kind of falls through uh, a loophole, basically where we assume that it's safe until proven otherwise. So we have mechanisms in place for when something like lead or cadmium ends up in uh, our homes to do something about it. It's not that everything is allowed, uh, but the reality is most things are allowed until they're proven guilty. So it's opposite of what I just told you I experienced working with the public back in Fresno. And I would say it's opposite from what most people expect. Most people expect that anything you can go to a store and buy has been tested or approved or somehow uh, is safe to use according to someone. The reality is not always the case. So these are three different studies with some of the key findings of them um, that show you that there are chemicals of concern, chemicals that scientists, public health professionals, doctors, others have shown are harmful to human health that are in our body. So this 2,300 uh, chemicals number, that comes from the state of California. The Consumer uh, Safety Products um, Bill here in California took lists of lists, lists of authoritative bodies, so international bodies of scientists agreeing that these are chemicals of concern. 2,300 of them are in uh, our products, things like bisphenol A, phthalates, probably others that you may have heard of. The CDC is following what chemicals get into our body. So they're currently tracking 265 chemicals, man-made chemicals that are on that list of 2,300. And it turns out that in uh, your average person, you have roughly 93% of those uh, 265 chemicals. The good news is they don't stay there forever. Um, we can talk more about that later. But we know that they're out there. We know that they're in our body. And when we start doing economic analysis to figure out what's the effect of these things. So we know they may be harmful. We know that they're in our body. But are they actually doing us any harm? Any toxicologist will tell you the dose makes the poison. right? So if it's a small amount, maybe it doesn't have any effect. So especially for chemicals that can act at, at low levels, things like endocrine disruptors, things like your phthalates and bisphenol A, analysis has been done by folks to take a look at what's the burden on our healthcare system. So in the US, their estimated burden, mostly from uh, chronic issues like uh, reproductive health issues and cancer, they estimate to be over $340 billion a year. So, this idea that we should assume that the things are safe until we prove them guilty may or may not be the best way to go about things. That's why we started the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry. The whole idea of green chemistry 
It's to design things from the ground up that are not only less depleting, but also have less of an impact on human health. And so that is the main motivator um, for what we do. And if you think about how these chemicals act, I want to disabuse people of this notion of an evil toxic chemical or an evil chemist. The reality is they're part of a complex soup. They're part of the complex soup that we live in. So if you look at data like this that shows cancer rates increasing, it's not all because of chemicals. I'm not here to scare you from going to the store. That's not my job. What I'm here to tell you is that we've been not paying enough attention to the part of a healthy lifestyle that also includes the sort of chemistry that we bring into our house that we bring, put on our body. So what I would say with data like this, part of it is increased aging, part of it is uh, poor lifestyle choices, other parts of it are exposure to chemicals. And when I think about the impact we could have by designing chemicals that are inherently safer from the beginning, it might be reducing cancer by 10%, maybe by 20%. It's not gonna be getting rid of cancer, but given how much money and how much effort we spend on things like cancer cures, I would argue, don't you think it makes sense to think about prevention? And that's, this, this is the prevention piece of chemistry. Rather than curing cancer, how do we prevent insult from uh, chemicals that we find in our daily lives in the environment? And it's important to think about how these things act in the body. They don't act as acute toxins, like I said. They act as inflammation uh, agents. They act as creating more oxidative stress on your body's, body's systems. They act by interfering with your body's chemistry, the hormonal signals that regulate bodily function. So they're not acting in short-term acute ways. They're acting in long-term chronic ways that are much harder to see, much harder to quantify. And that's one of the reasons why I like to take a precautionary approach that says, if we think chemicals can act in this way, how can we phase them out? Rather than waiting to prove whether or not it's 1% or 10% or 15% of the cancer burden. Because I can't look you in the eye as a scientist and tell you for sure it's one and not two. So, if you're not scared already, you can take this as your reading list. Um, but what I would say is, it, it really did it. This change in our relationship to chemicals started with Rachel Carson, has continued as a through line from there, showing that there are chemicals of concern. Um, some of these are inflammatory, some of them are more measured. But the reality is, uh, people are getting the message. And I would argue that more and more so, uh, your average consumer walking through the aisles looks a lot more like a hunter-gatherer approaching a mushroom. Their opinion of the chemistry that we find in our daily lives has switched. It's gone from being something that we generally think is harmless to treating it like a mushroom, which you don't eat unless you know it's safe. That switch is having effects. It's having real effects on the way people behave and on what happens in our economy. So, quick uh, show of hands. How many of you read labels? Just as I thought. Um, it's interesting, I, I'm not always sure. I have not, I don't always have majority audiences answer that, but, um, the reality is when you look at the data, the consumer marketing data, people are increasingly reading labels. People are increasingly reading labels, so the next question, and I won't make you all answer this, but is what are you looking for, right? If you're looking for organic, this is what people are typically actually thinking about when they look for that organic label. Organic certification means a ton of different things. It has to do with how much fertilizer you use, what sort of uh, processes you use to maintain the land. It also has to do with pesticides. And what we find, and what others have found, is that that component, the fact that organic to most people signals safer and fewer chemicals, has driven a huge shift in the marketplace for organic food. In the last 10 years, there have been $24 billion of acquisitions of small organic brands by large national players. Cha rewritten the landscape of what you find in grocery stores. And it's not just here on the coasts, it's
It's throughout the country. And so this trend of turning that bottle over and thinking about what might be in there is having a big an effect. And it starts with what you put in your body. And it makes perfect sense, right? Anyone can think about, oh, well, what I put in my body is going to have an effect on my health. I know what I eat is going to affect me, so I know the type of things that I eat is probably going to affect me. It starts there, and it moves to the things that we put on our body. So these are some of the things, acquisitions and other big mergers and deals that have happened within uh, the past few years in consumer products, right? Because it goes from what you eat to what you put on you, and from there to what you bring into your home. This trend of people preferring things that are safer is going to continue. It's like smoking. It doesn't go back in the other direction. And because of that, as a chemist, we need to think about what that means for the future of chemistry. And I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. This is what it doesn't mean. Chemical free is not the future. It might be the future of marketing, I've seen this on plenty of products. It's of course, begs the question, what is in a bottle of chemical-free sunscreen lotion? Vacuum? It's hard to say. But it takes me back to Fresno, right? People want products that work. They want things that align with their values. And they want to have stories that they feel good about. So what I want to do now is tell you about three trends I see in the future of chemistry that are changing the way we do chemistry, along with examples of people who are doing that, that are going to bring about the next generation of products that I do feel better about. Then we'll think a little bit about how we accelerate that change towards the end. So the first trend is responding directly to this notion of flipping over the label. It's something that within the consumer packaged goods world, the CPG world, they call clean labels. Basically, you now see people trying to communicate to you that their products are better by having fewer ingredients. I now see things like Cheerios advertise it only has three ingredients. Um, it's not what it used to say, right? So this clean labeling, what does that mean for chemistry? Because we also expect our consumer goods to last and be fresh on the store shelf, to not be contaminated with um, other uh, biological agents, right? To make sure that that thing is safe. So, I see a huge opportunity in creating new preservatives. Preservatives that are derived from things that look like natural uh, additives on the label, right? So Carry Cure is a company that has proteins that are naturally uh, antibacterial. And so rather than putting a petroleum-based or synthetic preservative in there, like parabens, has anyone heard of parabens? You've seen that on labels, paraben-free. That's a preservative. That's what it's in there for. It's not in there to hurt you. It's in there to keep you safe, actually. Um, so CarryCure is a great example of a company creating the next generation of chemicals that are going to keep those things safe without putting scary chemical names on your labels. Um, similarly, Taste Natural. I love this one, given the, the outcry uh, around um, uh, Le Creuset, the bubbly water lately. I don't know if anyone's been watching. Right, that just says natural flavoring, right? Taste natural would fit under that category as well, which is it's a, a extract of cucumber peels. Cucumber peels that actually bind to bitter and metallic agents in your food. So rather than using sugar to cover up bad tastes, you can use an extract from a food product um, to change your perception of a food. So it can allow you to reduce sugar by, um, 50 to 100%, depending on what the other additives are. It can allow you to reduce salt by, uh, similarly, 75 to 100% by switching over to potassium chloride rather than sodium chloride. Sodium is what you're always tracking. Um, potassium also tastes salty, but it, also, it has a metallic flavor that's blocked. And so this is a way to give you that experience that you want, something that functions, but in a package you feel good about. And the important thing in both of these cases is that it's made using uh, chemicals that are not only derived from natural sources, but that are large proteins and that break down in the environment. The two things that I dislike most about chemicals, one, are things that are harmful to our health, but two, things that persist in the environment. 
It's not just because of the uh, whales and the ocean. It's because things that persist in the environment will eventually accumulate, accumulate and persist up the food chain. And even if they're not that bad, if they don't break down, it means we're all going to be more exposed to them over time. So as a chemist, I always encourage my young students to think about designing chemicals that instead of staying around forever, stay around only as long as you need them and then disappear. So that's the first trend, clean labels. Oh, and I promised I'd tell you a little story about uh, uh, Le Creuset. So that one is great, right? It just says natural flavors. Now they're being sued because they have cockroach poison, right? So what is that? Back to our cockroaches. Um, interesting, it's linalol, linalol, which is one of the extracts that you can get that uh, will attract cockroaches and other things, back to those pheromone traps, towards what you have. So it's not that it's necessarily the poison, but it is true that it's used in cockroach uh, baits, right? So both sides can be telling the truth. It's just a matter of understanding what is the implication for health, and it's why I can't stand chemical by chemical bans and really want things that say what type of chemistry do we want, and is this the type of chemistry that meets with our expectations, right? First trend, clean labels. Second trend, the circular economy. This does have to do with the ocean and um, trying to make sure we don't have a bunch of plastic pollution. I love this. This was a, an issue in, I don't know, 1991 and again in 1997, but now all of a sudden in 2018, we again care about ocean plastic pollution. So um, it's come back around. I hope it sticks around this time. Um, but it is an important problem, and because it really represents this design challenge, this the challenge of making chemicals and materials that exist for their useful lifetime, but don't persist for hundreds or thousands of years. Why do we have ocean plastic pollution? Because we make bonds in our polymers that don't break down in the marine environment or in the natural environment. So um, you have two options. Either you can take those bonds, because they're still worth uh, energy and they're worth money and reuse them and so Titan Bio is a great example of that where you can take mixed cotton polyester break it all back down and get back recycled polyester resin that you can turn into a fiber get out cotton um, and cellulose that you can spin into a rayon or viscose so it's not exactly back to cotton and polyester but it's a back to polyester and a cellulosic fiber um, so closing the loop on our apparel and that's an important thing to do because we end up throwing away a lot of apparel. Um, Ecologic is closing the loop on our single-use packaging. Um, they're doing that by taking a bottle and breaking it into its component parts. You need it to do two things. You need it to provide structure so that you can ship it, get it to the store, distribute it. The second thing you need it to do is protect the ingredients inside. So they've separated those two things and make a rigid bottle out of paper, which provides all the structural components, and then have a thin film of bioplastic or recycled plastic that provides the protection to the interior thing. It reduces the amount of plastic. It uses all recycled inputs, so either bio-based or recycled resins that go into it. So you're using some of that waste, which is critically important uh, for making a circular economy work. And finally, the great thing is if you put it into your mixed waste blue bin, it breaks back apart into its two pieces so that the paper goes where it belongs and the plastic goes where it belongs. People like things that work. They don't want to necessarily do more, but we need to design for the system we have, right? So the smart answer is how do you separate components rather than putting everything together? One of the hardest challenges we have in manufacturing is we keep making multi-layer films and multi-component packaging that is great and is cheap, but then we can never get the value back out. So this is going in that opposite direction. Um, the last example up there, Lindgrove, is exciting. It's a, a company that takes fibers, flax fibers, and embeds them in a bioplastic resin. So instead of using carbon fiber or other high energy high cost components to create uh, a reinforced resin, they're able to use flax, which is a, a fiber that grows on marginal lands. And they also do it in a one direction. So you can get these beautiful things that look like wood. So rather than using wood or wood varnishes, you can make these materials that are strong and durable 
and can be separated back into their component parts of their image file. So the third trend, my favorite trend actually, despite the fact that I'm a chemist. Um, I love our changing relationship with bacteria. This is another one that has started with what we put in our mouth, but I predict the biggest change in the next uh, kind of uh, five to 10 years in terms of the things that you're gonna see on the store shelf is you're gonna see more bacteria for, uh, performing a function. So we're already doing things like having uh, probiotic supplements. 99% of probiotic supplements are nothing but lactobacillus, which is a great, wonderful bacteria, but it does not do everything in our gut. Our gut is much more interesting than that. Um, so there are interesting companies like Fit Biomics who are trying to expand that range. Stop just using one bacteria and find out what makes your gut actually healthy. What are the sorts of organisms that you find in healthy people that you don't find in people with certain diseases? What are the sorts of organisms that you find, this is my favorite because they are selling things in the end, what are the sort of things that you find in a high performance athlete that you don't find in your average person? Things like bacteria that break down lactate better. Makes sense. Keeps lactic acid buildup from happening. So you can buy probiotic drinks that have bacteria specifically designed to break down lactate faster. So bacteria actually forming a function. And it's not just when what we eat. Mother dirt, this is, a, this is something you can buy today, is a bottle with water and nitrosomonas bacteria. Nitrosomonas bacteria, most people before mother dirt uh, that cared about it worked at wastewater treatment plants. Um, nitrosomonas bacteria is a nitrogen oxidizing bacteria. It's actually super important to the ecosystem around breaking down uh, nitrogen, especially in things like wastewater treatment plants. It's also a bacteria that your wa typical wastewater treatment folks can tell you is very finicky. It doesn't like a lot of the um, surfactants that we've been putting into the wastewater and doesn't like the surfactants we put onto our skin. So the sulfates and phosphates that we typically use in formulated uh, products end up killing the nitrosomonas bacteria. So the person behind AO Biome and Mother Dirt said, wait a second, what's different now and what's different on human skin than humans before we started using all of these products? And hypothesized, has not proved, but hypothesized that nitrosomonas bacteria is one of the missing creatures. And so is selling a bottle with water and bacteria that you can spray. They don't make any claims. And the reason they don't make any claims is because they're also going through FDA as a treatment to be registered and sold as a drug for acne and for other skin diseases. As nothing but water and nitrosomonas bacteria. The same thing you can buy as a skin spritzer today um, at Mother Dirt is actually being tested for its uh, efficacy as a drug um, in trials. And what's amazing is it, it makes perfect sense. It's filling out this microbiome. Our microbiome is not just in our gut. Whether or not people like this you take nothing else away, know that you have on the region that's covered by your pants, four different ecosystems. How cool is that? Four different ecosystems with different bacteria thriving and living there. And so it makes sense that if you want to affect things like skin health, things like body health, you can start, instead of putting other uh, things on there, start taking care of your microbiome. And if that were crazy enough, going all the way to uh, Aunt Fanny's and another company I've run into recently called uh, Counterculture, who are making cleaning solutions. That similarly, instead of just trying to kill all the bacteria, like a dilute solution of uh, sodium hypochlorite, otherwise known as bleach, um, our favorite cleaner that just is, wipes everything out. They say, hey, just like the bacteria on our body or bacteria in our gut, the bacteria in our home isn't actually all bad. So rather than fight all the bacteria, why not nurture the good bacteria? So you're gonna find cleaning agents. Rather than claiming how much they kill bacteria, you're gonna find cleaning agents that are actually spraying bacteria onto the surfaces of your home. You weren't grossed out by the first two, I'm sure I grossed you out with the third one. Um, but I, it is changing, and I think it's changing for the better. It's a, this is part of that same shift, right? It's all part of the seismic shift thinking, moving away from traditional, let's extract that chemistry, make it into something that 
fits our needs today and then dispose of it to a systems-based approach. And I think bacteria is the nicest and most fun way to do that. So hopefully, in this first part of the talk, what I've convinced you of is one, there are issues with some of the chemistry we use. But two, there is exciting work going on that could address many of those issues um, using cool and interesting new chemistry. So the third thing that, that that brings us to is how do we make that happen more quickly? So I would argue that it has to start with this observation, that no chemicals are put in there to harm you. They're put in there to form a function. So the chemistry that we're all flipping over that bottle to look to avoid isn't in there to harm us. Parabens are in there to increase shelf life. Bisphenol A is in there to bind the plastic to the metal. Um, perfluorinated compounds are in there to provide durable water repellency. Nothing is in there to harm you. It's in there because it's forming a function. So if we want to think about how we get to this preferred chemistry, the first thing we have to recognize is that anyone who's not a chemist don't buy chemicals, they buy function. And if you think about function rather than about chemistry, you can start finding safer and better solutions. So let's talk more about um, apparel. If we, instead of talking in the abstract, start thinking in the concrete, what are the challenges in apparel? I would say that there are three challenges. One's clearly related to chemistry, the amount of chemistry it takes to actually produce the clothing that we wear on a regular basis. But the other two are more about waste and water usage, right? So we produce way more clothing um, than we'd ever need, and we don't reuse it or use it in a, in a beneficial way. And that clothing takes a ton of water to produce. And that's true of cotton, which is a very water-hungry uh, crop. And it's also true of the synthetics, which are an increasing part of our wardrobe. So it's true of the polyesters and nylons and everything else as well. So when we think about how do we address this problem while also selecting against any of the chemicals of concern, what we have done, Safer Made, is get together with the people who understand what people want. These are the people who buy function, and some of the people who provide the chemistry, for that matter. And try to understand what are the opportunities um, for innovation that consumers want, but that avoid the hazardous chemicals. So in order to do that, you have to build on the hard work of what the industry has already done. And that is come together as a group and figure out there are things that they are using that they don't particularly want to advertise to you, whether that's chromium and wool mordants or uh, perfluorinated compounds and DWRs. They have lists of chemicals that they're already monitoring, partially because of pressure from Greenpeace and others, partially because they know that if you learn about it, you might not buy their products. Um, so they're already working on addressing these chemicals of concern. And they already have lists, lists of hundreds or thousands of chemicals that they'd like to substitute. And all too often, just like people's experience when they start hearing about chemicals of concern and get worried about every last chemical that they might come into contact with, it feels overwhelming at first. It feels like a mess of different things and a challenge that's too complicated to solve. And so what we do, and one of the things that I teach my students to do, and that I encourage uh, both advocacy organizations as well as uh, businesses to do, is stop thinking about hundreds and thousands of individual chemicals and start thinking about groups. Because even though those chemicals aren't the same, what you find are the same patterns over and over again. So, for the chemists in the world, these are the six biggest classes or groups of chemicals that I see on those lists of hundreds of things. And so when you're looking for alternatives, when you're looking for replacements, you not only don't want anything on the list, but you want to pay extra care to your selection of chemicals within these categories. You want to pay extra care to what they do in the function. And why do you want to pay extra care? Because this is what we've done in the past. If all you say is no, if the only signal you give to the, um, 
to the marketplace is no, then you get what we call regrettable substitution. Anyone here of BPA, bisphenol A? We said no to bisphenol A. We said no to bisphenol A in our cans. And now you go look in the grocery store and you see BPA free on almost everything. You see BPA free marked on things that never had bisphenol A in it. <laughs> That's true. Um, but in the case of cans of, say, tomatoes that you say see marked BPA free, they have BPS. Bisphenol S, it's the same molecule. You swap out um, one carbon and you put in a sulfur and two oxygens. It binds to the hormone receptor the same way bisphenol A did, but it's not BPA. This is what happens when you don't think in classes. You get the thing that is closest to the thing you just banned. And it's not because chemists are bad. It's because all you told them was, no, I don't want X. And what we need to say is we don't want chemicals that are in this class. We want th don't want things that are endocrine receptors. We want things that provide that function without the harm. And so it's critically important, and this, these are all examples that you may or may not have run into in the news, where you get this substitution of one bad chemical for another thing that's in the same class. Um, and so if we're going to avoid this, we have to understand function. And that's why I take that first grouping of chemicals of concern and turn it into what the heck are they doing to make the fabric, right? So what are those chemical, what function are those chemicals providing? and then go back to all of those brands and all those startups out there that are doing work and saying what are the opportunities to bring something to market that can differentiate, that can tell a story that's gonna resonate with your consumer base and that is actually going to have safer chemistry in it. So what we did was take a whole landscape of what's going on not only in the chemicals of concern but also in all of these alternatives. We took a look at 16 different companies trying to make non-animal leather. It's fascinating, right? It's not one answer, it's many answers. Um, non-animal leather is a great idea because not only do you have the, the CO2 and other warming impacts of raising those animals, but you also use chromium and a number of hazardous chemicals in the tanning of that leather. So this is an example where when I look at a mushroom leather, so similarly made out of protein networks, but grown um, on a plate of uh, soil rather than on a cow, you can start from the ground up to build that system so that it doesn't need those same chromium mordants or um, polyurethane finishes. You can think about it from the ground up. If there's one thing that I've learned both working at a big university and with big companies is it's a heck of a lot easier to change things early on than once they're already going. Once they're already going, everyone has a reason not to change. But when you're still only making things at the you know, scale of this stage, everyone's willing to change. Um, and so there's a huge opportunity in looking early on in the development, in encouraging brands and encouraging people to try new things while they can still make a difference, and then build them with this notion of classes and safer chemistry in mind. So if you are interested, this is all available, and it's outlined in this report. So it includes hundreds of different startups who are all working on addressing this issue of uh, chemicals of concern in the textile supply chain. We're doing the same thing now for food contact packaging, right? So people are now aware of the fact that they might want to choose food that is uh, made in a way that's more aligned with their values, made in a way that uses less chemically intensive things, but then they go ahead and they put it in um, uh, the same old plastic and or materials that they used to use. My favorite up near where I live, there's a fancy cheese shop. You can buy fancy cheeses from around the world. And even in the fanciest cheese shop, what do they wrap it in? Saran wrap. What's saran wrap made out of? Petroleum, yes. Any petroleum in particular? Polyvinyl chloride made out of polyvinyl chloride, and why is it so stretchy? Phthalates. Yeah, those same things that we've been trying to get rid of in our uh, sunscreen and everything else, we actually wrap our cheese in it. I love it. Um, similarly, uh, same fancy th restaurants in, uh, in North Berkeley, um, 
were uh, giving out recycled paper, um, pizza boxes, and or plates. They looked brown. They were clearly aligned with all the hippie do-gooder stuff, right, that makes life good up there in North Berkeley. We tested them for perfluorinated compounds, Teflon-like chemistry. About half of them came back positive. <laughs> because it's a grease barrier. And they weren't trying to do anything bad. They didn't know it was in there, right? And as soon as uh, we told them, they were very willing to take it out. But it's just fascinating. And so the same analysis that we're, we did here in the textile industry, we're currently working on for food contact materials. Because again, people want to do the right thing. Companies want to do the right thing. They often just don't have enough chemists helping them out. And chemists are often too defensive to go out there and admit what we've done um, to, for the system to work very well. And so that brings me to the last little section of what we're trying to do in a small way to make this happen faster. So hopefully now I've, I've given you a sense for the fact that there is a challenge out there when it comes to safer chemistry, that there's new innovation that's occurring, and that when we look sector by sector, there are clear defined opportunities. It's not like an overwhelming world of, oh no, what do we do about all bad petroleum chemicals? There's specific levers that we can pull to focus on function and focus on eliminating hazardous chemicals that are going to work in the long run. So what I did after starting the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry is start what I do now today on a daily basis. And that's Safer Made. We're an early stage venture capital fund that invests in these sorts of companies, the companies I've been talking to you about today. And we do it in the three sectors I've told you about today. In food contact, in packaging, in textiles, and in consumer formulated products. We work with the leading industry players in each of those sectors to understand what are their performance needs. What are the opportunities for differentiating in this way? And how can we continue to educate the customer in a way that's going to help them make better decisions for themselves and their family in the long run? These are the companies that we've, we've backed so far. And so none of these things are perfect. Some of them are really fun. I already told you about Ecologic. Mimikai is uh, really cool because I mean, down here you don't have to worry about it so much, but it's an insect repellent. Um, deets and, uh, not deets, um, ticks and mosquitoes without using DEET. And what I love about this is, again, it's using smart chemistry. So the chemistry is a molecule 2-1-decanone. It was originally found in the wild tomato plant, so it was used by biology as the way to repel pests from those plants. And the cool thing is, it's actually also a flavor and fragrance. So we have a ton of data on human contact, human consumption. We know that it's safe. We just didn't know that it was an insect repellent. And they're the first company to get it registered as an insect repellent, actually here in LA, based right in Venice Beach. Um, and uh, it's an exciting way to rethink um, what, how you repel mosquitoes. And it's still as effective as the thing that it's, it's um, replacing. Repurpose similarly is an LA-based company. Um, and it eliminates the reason why we've actually been working with them for two years to eliminate the perfluorinated compounds, the Teflon-like chemistry that I mentioned in their food contact. Um, because we saw this was a problem, we wouldn't ever invest in a company that was using that sort of chemistry. But by coming in there and working with them, we're all help, able to guide them towards the solutions that could still make sense for them and make sense for their business. And once they accomplished them, that, that was something that we could invest in. So this is, I could never do this alone. That is the story of my whole career. I would have never learned about public policy if it weren't for my colleagues at the School of Public Health. I couldn't be doing investment in early stage companies if it wasn't for my current business partner, Adrian, who comes from that world of investments. In the end, I'm just a chemist. I'm just a chemist from the Central Valley um, who wants to make things that are better for human health and the environment. But we have an excellent team of people around us and always have had, and that is by what makes the difference in the long run. Um, and so, Putting back on my professor hat, I have one last thing for you tonight, and that's your homework. So if I've done my job here tonight, I've convinced you 
that there is a challenge in chemistry, but that there are lots of solutions, and that we can drive the market towards safer alternatives. So what can you do to help? Because not all of us are investing in early stage companies. There's a lot of other work that has to be done. This work doesn't happen if there isn't um, an alignment between advocacy organizations, government organizations, business, and financial institutions. And so all of us touch each of those institutions in our own way. You'll do whatever is most comfortable for you on this list. I'll come back next year and collect the homework assignment to find out what you have done. But basically, there are, th there are four things that I see that can make a difference. One is demanding transparency. That's transparency in the products you buy, including your food, but also things that you don't currently know much about. This drove me crazy as a young parent, trying to figure out how I could bring, you know, toys. Like, plastics aren't all bad, but there are some plastics, like polyvinyl chloride, that I don't like a lot. And there are other plastics that I'm relatively okay with. But if I'm gonna buy a, in the case I'm thinking of now is foam pads, right, it's for my daughter's room. Like, finding out what the heck is in that foam is next to impossible. That drives me crazy, that has got to change. Um, and it's gonna change because we're gonna keep asking those questions and it's gonna change because there are gonna be other regulatory arms that come in and pressure people to disclose. That's what we already see. You get more voluntary disclosure than required disclosure. It used to be that you'd rarely see ingredients on uh, soaps or other formulated goods. All of the stuff you see now is actually voluntary. It's not required. Um, it's interesting to think about whether that should be required or not. But demanding transparency is something we can all do. Second is supporting advocacy. Advocacy is what uh, brings these, que these questions to the, to the forefront. And they're the ones that provide resources that you can look at. So things like Environmental Working Group, which is an advocacy organization that also has a skin deep database, can tell you about all the products that you may or may not want to buy. Similarly, with the Good, Good Guide, Green Science Policy Institute, uh, Center for Environmental Health and the Mind the Store campaign, they're the people that are putting pressure on regulators and businesses to do the right thing because they do the right thing because they know that that's good for them long term, but they also do the right thing because if they don't, there's people at their door threatening them. This is how the whole system works together. Next thing is aligning your money with your values. And this might be in the store where you buy something, or it might be in your retirement account where you want to take a good, deep, hard look at what sorts of funds you're invested in over the near term and long term, right? Finance is just a tool for the future, right? It's nothing special. This was like the, the thing that I realized as a chemist coming into this world. Like, I used to be scared of finance. I didn't manage my retirement account. I didn't think about those things. And then I realized, my partner told me, it's just a story about the future. It's true whether it's a stock market or your personal bank account. What are those dollars and cents? They're just the ability to create something in the future, right? And so it's important that if you want change in the future, you make sure that your money is representing that change. And that's something that's increasingly is increasingly a trend that you're seeing. Even institutions like BlackRock, who've been around forever, not particularly known for their sustainable investing initiatives, came out in the Financial Times this week and said that they see this as the biggest area of growth and that it's not concessionary. It's not less, you don't make less money by investing in things that are better for the environment. You make as much money in some cases more. That's been a counterintuitive message, but it's something that's increasingly true and something that I challenge all of you to think about. Um, and then the last piece is just sharing what you learned. It comes back to those original observations about people. We are social creatures, and in the end, you may or may not trust what I have to say, but you trust what your family tells you, what your friends tell you, what people in your immediate vicinity tell you. And so sharing is the most important thing that we can all do around driving this change. And I'm excited because I see that ch sharing happening more and more, and because of changes in the way information is disseminated, it happens a lot faster than it used to. I think that this challenge, the chemistry piece of the environmental challenge, is actually much easier to address than the energy piece. 
think it's much more tractable. And I think it has a much more personal resonance. And it's gone underappreciated for far too long. So with that, I want to thank you for your time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, whether they're product related, or whether they're about health, um, or bacteria. Don't forget my favorite. Um, but I want to thank you for your attention and thank uh, Distinctive Voices for having me here tonight.